Hey there, friends. It's Lucifer Means Lightbringer, and it's time for the good stuff. That's right. It's a special occasion, and we're breaking out the rare vintage. Although this wine looks a little blue to me. Does, it, does this look blue to you? Anyway, in our last video, we were talking about the idea of the others looking for a new Night's King. And now it's time to talk about that person being Euron Greyjoy, the Crow's Eye. Sounds straightforward, right? Well, it's not. Euron's face is practically bursting with esoteric symbolism, and when you clicked on this video, the needed dose of shade of the evening for you to understand all the shit was secreted from your mouse or trackpad or phone case and onto your hands, and now it's about to get weird. Kidding aside, if you haven't read the Winds of Winter early release chapter called The Forsaken, then heads up, because we are going to discuss it in depth here, as it's key to understanding Euron's coming role as King of the Apocalypse. I'd also recommend watching my last few videos that lead up to this one, although I would, I would say that, right, as they propose a series of exciting premises which build upon one another. These exciting premises are based on a combination of symbolic and archetypal analysis and good old-fashioned logic, and they include such heresies as, I think Night's King and Queen lived at the beginning of the Long Night and created the very first Others. I think that the original Azor Ahai became the Night's King and that it was his fiery dragon seed and soul taken by Night's Queen and then used to make the Others. And in my last video, A New Night's King, I propose that the Others are currently looking for someone to lead them to make into a new Night's King. Based on the symbolism contained in the A Game of Thrones prologue and elsewhere, it seems that in archetypal terms, this new leader of the Others should be a one-eyed, Odin-like ice wizard who seeks to or has transcended death. Someone who seeks to or has attained an icy version of the Fire of the Gods. Some sort of icy cross between Blood Raven and Azor High, in other words. That's the kind of person the Others seem to be looking for. I left off suggesting that our two main candidates to become such a new Night's King figure are Euron Crow's Eye and Jon Snow, for very different reasons and with very different implications. For example, if Jon plays a Night's King role, it will be either because the others have stolen and animated his corpse, likely in an attempt to use it to help them cross the wall, or because the very end game of the story could require Jon to become otherized, if you will, as a part of pacifying some ancient enmity with the others. Night's King Jon Snow will have to wait for his own video, though, because today it's time to talk about Night's King Crow's Eye, Euron of the Graves and Charnel Pits. If Euron becomes a new Night's King, it will be because he seriously wants to fuck shit up, or perhaps because he opened one door too many without knowing quite what the hell he was doing. Behold Aaron Dampere's Shade of the Evening-induced nightmare vision of Euron from that forsaken chapter. The bleeding star bespoke the end, he said to Aaron. These are the last days when the world shall be broken and remade. A new god shall be born from the graves and charnel pits. Then Euron lifted a great horn to his lips and blew, and dragons and krakens and sphinxes came at his command and bowed before him. Kneel, brother, the crow's eye commanded. I am your king. I am your god. Worship me, and I will raise you up to be my priest. Alright, so we are going to blow our brains out with some more complex symbolism later in the video. However, the basic case for Euron as a new Knight's King figure, a new King of the Apocalypse, is actually pretty straightforward. Euron is someone who's quite literally thrilled about the idea of the world being destroyed, and he thinks that this presents him with the opportunity to become some sort of god on Earth. Euron sees himself as a god king, born from the graves and charnel pits, after the bleeding star signals the end and the last days. Or, put more simply, he wants to become a god of death who rules over the new long night. He wants to be the beast from Revelations, or maybe the Antichrist and the beast, or maybe the Antichrist riding the beast. But you get the point. Not only does this cast Euron as the third act villain of A Song of Ice and Fire, it also sounds a lot like my interpretation of the original Azor Ahai, as someone who first causes the Long Night by breaking the moon and killing Nissa Nissa in a blood magic ritual, then comes to power during the darkness and chaos that follows after, with his story finally ending in Westeros, with Azor Ahai becoming Night's King, creator and leader of the Others. Before it's all said and done, I believe that Euron is actually going to show us every step of that path, all the way from Ashai to the cozy saddle of an ice dragon. We'll start today with the Azor Ahai Ashai end of things, and then work our way west and north to Night's King territory. We are going to have to split this expedition in two. What started as one Euron script actually grew to over an hour in length, so today we're going to talk about Euron as an evil version of Azor Ahai Reborn, or even a Bloodstone Emperor Reborn, if you prefer. And in part two, we'll look at the specific 
Night's King symbolism. So let me quickly say thank you to all of you watching, liking, and commenting on my videos lately, and thanks especially to everyone subscribing to the channel via that sexy red subscribe button below, which you should absolutely press if you haven't already. The channel is growing rapidly towards our next goal of 30,000 subs, and it's all thanks to you guys. Well, and a little bit thanks to me, but mostly to you guys. Thanks also to everyone who has joined our Patreon campaign, which you can find out more about at LucifermeansLightbringer.com. And thanks very much to everyone sending in one-time donations at paypal.me slash mythicalastronomy. And don't forget that you can ask a question with your PayPal. Ask me the questions, Bridge Keeper. I'm not afraid. All right, let's quaff some shade of the evening and dream up some nightmares of the apocalypse. As you just saw, Euron believes the Red Comet was the herald of his apotheosis, and thanks for that $10 word, Quinn's ideas. And that means to become a god, by the way. Now, it's true that almost everyone in A Song of Ice and Fire did kind of sort of look up at the Red Comet to think, oh, that's a special sign just for me. But it's also true that the prophecy of Azor High's rebirth says that he will appear when the cold darkness gathers and the bleeding star streaks through the sky. The bleeding star has come and gone, the winds of winter are getting set to blow, and here is Euron, reaching his high and as hard as he can for pretty much any kind of fire of the gods that he can get his hands on. Azor High Reborn is supposed to be a hero, of course, and I fully expect Jon and Daenerys to fulfill that side of the archetype. But as I have said many times, there is abundant evidence that the original Azor High was a villainous figure who caused the Long Night. He did murder his wife in a horrific blood magic ritual, after all, and that's not very heroic. And then it's also said that he cracked the moon when he did that. Cracking the moon seems destructive in general, and of course in particular, it's exactly the sort of thing that could cause a long night event, because any sort of lunar catastrophe that involved a crack across the face of the moon would result in pieces of broken moon raining down on ye old planetos as moon meteors. The impact of these meteors might be sufficient to cause an impact winter, which is a cloaking of the skies with dust, ash, and debris that can last several years. Indeed, that is exactly what I think happened, as most of you will know. I believe that the moon cracking recorded in both the Azor High myth and the Carthian origin of dragons myth refers to a very real celestial catastrophe in the past which involved moon meteors and which created a magical version of an impact winter. Thus, the Azor High myth begins to read more like the tale of a man who committed blood sacrifice to gain great magical power but caused great damage to the world when he did so. And that sounds an awful lot like Euron's future, doesn't it? In other words, the idea that one manifestation of Azor High Reborn might actually be a heinous villain who seeks to gain power through the death and chaos of a new long night, or whom even seeks to bring about that new long night, isn't so strange. In fact, I think that Euron will ultimately prove to be the third head of the dragon, if you will, though obviously he'll be an evil dragon head and will likely end up opposing Danny and John in some sort of epic dragon battle. And when we look at the TV show events, where the Night's King stole Viserion and fought Danny and John on Dragonback, it's pretty easy to see that we need something similar to happen in the book so that we can have a good old-fashioned dragon fight. One of those dragons has to get turned against Team Danny somehow, whether through Euron's dragon horn or some sort of icy whiting process like the show. I think it's similarly easy to see that that steal a dragon and oppose John and Danny role played by the TV show Night King will almost certainly be played by Euron in the books. He's got a dragon horn after all, and he could even turn into a Night's King. That's the premise of this video and the next one, so maybe he'll steal Viserion by whiting him just like the TV show Night King did. If Euron is to both ride a dragon and become the most powerful villain of the new Long Night, then he will rightfully be seen both as an Azor Ahai Reborn person and as a Night's King person. That's certainly how Euron sees himself and how he wants to be seen. Euron has, of course, according to him anyway, been to both Valyria and A Shy by the Shadow, the two places in the world which are stated to be places where dragons come from, and the two places most strongly associated with Azor Ahai. A Shy is where the Azor Ahai legend comes from, and as you all probably know, I think the ancient A Shy texts about a pre-Valyrian dragonlord culture having existed in A Shy are quite accurate. In Ashai, the tales are many and confused, but certain texts, all impossibly ancient, claim that dragons first came from the shadow, a place where all of our learning fails us. These Ashai histories say that a people so ancient they had no name first tamed dragons in the shadow and brought them to Valyria, teaching the Valyrians their arts before departing from the annals. It is my belief that this ancient Ashai Dragonlord Kingdom was actually the one remembered in Yi-T history as the Great Empire of the Dawn, and it seems that Euron very much wants to cast himself in the image of their god emperors. More on this in a moment. 
The point for now, and really the entire point of figuring out that there were ancient dragon lords in Ashai in the first place, is that Azor Ahai himself was almost certainly a dragon lord of their lineage. Thus, when we think of Azor Ahai coming to Westeros from Ashai during the Long Night, we should think of him as a dragon lord, quite possibly as an evil dragon lord, just like Euron will be. Now as for doomed Valyria, to which Euron claims to have sailed, they were, of course, a dragonlord empire whose magic is rooted in fire and blood. In fact, all of their magic seems taken straight from the Azor Ahai mythology, or at least we can say that it works on the same principles. Valyria fashions magic swords with human sacrifice and blood magic, just as Azor Ahai did. Valyria, of course, tames and rides dragons, and I believe the original Azor Ahai did both, and Azor Ahai Reborn is prophesied to do both. The Valyrians wielded fire magic directly, as do the Relorists, who prophesy Azor Ahai's return. And finally, the Valyrians possess all the weapons needed to defeat the others, from dragon glass to Valyrian steel to the dragon themselves, and of course that is what Azor Ahai Reborn is prophesied to do. According to some prophecies, Azor Ahai Reborn should come from the blood of Valyria by way of House Targaryen, and if Valyria does in fact descend from the ancient Ashai dragon lords of the Great Empire of the Dawn, then there may actually be a continuous bloodline from Azor Ahai down to, say, Jon and Daenerys. Now Euron may not have any Valyrian blood, but he's sure trying to dress up like a Valyrian. Call it Valyrian cosplay. This is from the Forsaken Winds of Winter chapter again. Euron Crow's Eye stood upon the deck of silence, clad in a suit of black scale armor like nothing Euron had ever seen before. Dark as smoke it was, but Euron wore it as easily as if it were the thinnest silk. The scales were edged in red gold and gleamed and shimmered when they moved. Patterns could be seen within the metal, whorls and glyphs and arcane symbols folded into the steel. Valerian steel, the damp hair knew. His armor is Valerian steel. In all the Seven Kingdoms, no man owned a suit of Valyrian steel. Such things had been known 400 years ago, in the days before the Doom, but even then, they would have cost a kingdom. Euron did not lie. He has been to Valyria. No wonder he was mad. Now, we don't really know for sure where Euron got that Valyrian steel suit of armor. If not from Valyria, then it could only have come from perhaps Ashai or maybe Karth. But that's kind of beside the point in the context of interpreting Euron's archetype. He's presenting himself as a Valyrian warrior and sorcerer, and he's even suggesting that he can survive that which the Valyrians could not, by claiming to have sailed into doomed Valyria and back out again, something nobody else has apparently ever done. So Euron is wearing Valyrian armor, and he's claiming the comet as his herald. But Azor Ahai Reborn is, of course, most famous for his flaming sword and his dragons, and Euron has neither of those things. Yet. However, it's no secret that he has plans to acquire a dragon, and the magical talisman he's going to use to do so is described in very strong Lightbringer terminology. I am, of course, talking about the eight-foot-tall, twisted and evil-looking Valyrian Dragonbinder Horn. Sharp as a sword thrust, the sound of a horn split the air. Bright and baneful was its voice, a shivering hot scream that made a man's bones seem to thrum within him. The cry lingered in the damp sea air. As you can see, the sound of the horn is suggested as being like a sword. It's as sharp as a sword thrust, and it splits the air. And the phrase shivering hot gives the idea of it being a flaming sword, or perhaps you might say a sword of ice and fire. The horn itself actually does burn as it is blown, with the glyphs glowing redly at first, and then finally burning and shimmering with white fire. The horn also compares very well to a Valyrian steel sword, just in raw physical terms. It's pointy and black, it's a horn from an actual dragon, and it's even banded in Valyrian steel. And again, it lights up with magical fire, and is described as a burning sword here. Author's words, not mine. Now, when Nissa Nissa was stabbed with Lightbringer, she famously let loose with that cry of agony and ecstasy which left a crack across the face of the moon, and that idea is clearly and deliberately evoked when the Dragonbinder horn is blown. The horn's sound, besides being described like a sword thrust, also sounds like a person's ultimate cry of pain and suffering. It's described as a scream, a cry, a shriek, a baneful voice, and a wail of pain and fury that burns the ears. And this terrible screaming sound went on and on until it filled the whole wet world. And again, it's not just that this horrible screaming sound that fills the world sounds like the sort of scream that could crack a moon open. The thing causing this scream is described as a burning dragon sword. Heck, even the idea of the horn calling dragons can allude to the moon cracking event in symbolic terms since Nissa Nissa's cry summoned the moon meteor dragons, so to speak. And here we have a dragon horn, which is screaming and crying, and supposedly summoning dragons. 
We can also observe that according to the Valerian glyphs etched on the bands of the horn, it seems to operate on the same magical principle that powered Azor Ahai's Lightbringer. It says, blood for fire, fire for blood. Nissanus's blood is what set Lightbringer on fire, while here it's the hornblower's life that is demanded in payment for the horn's use. He bled as he blew the horn, and his lungs were found to have been burnt black after he died, which he did shortly after tooting on the Hellhorn. So in summation, the Valerian dragon horn is described like a flaming sword, it sounds like Nissanissa's cry that broke the moon, uses the same magical mechanics as Lightbringer, and is supposed to bind to Euron's will the dragons that will certify him as Azor High Reborn. For now, it seems that this is Euron's Lightbringer symbol, though I wouldn't rule out his whipping out a real Valerian steel sword at some point, especially since two of his Ironborn subjects currently possess one. House Harlaw has one called Nightfall, and House Drum has one called Red Rain, and, oh, wouldn't you know it, those are both terrific Lightbringer Long Night symbolic sword names. Since the Long Night was a magical Nightfall, caused by a red rain of bleeding stars. Those bleeding stars were remembered as dragons and flaming swords when they fell to the earth, and Red Rain and Nightfall are dragon swords. Bonus round entry, b -b bonus round for Euron as a pseudo-Valerian. He might be using glass candles already. In A Clash of Kings, Zaro Zoan Daxos tells Daenerys about several odd things that have started happening lately around Karth, one of which kinda sorta sounds like Euron using an alias and playing with glass candles. It is said that the glass candles are burning in the house of Eurathon Nightwalker that have not burned in a hundred years. There are some who think that Burathon Nightwalker is just the name Euron was using when he stayed in Karth before he came back to the Iron Islands, and that certainly doesn't seem far-fetched to me. There's an Ironborn King whom Euron may parallel, and his name is Urathon Goodbrother, nicknamed Bad Brother for his evil deeds. He's thrown down in favor of Torgan the Latecomer, who appears to be foreshadowing for the Theon the Latecomer theory, which speculates on Theon becoming King of the Iron Islands at the end of the story after not having been present for Euron's Kingsmoot, just as Torgan was not present for Eurathon Bad Brothers Kingsmoot, hence the name Latecomer. If Eurathon Nightwalker is Euron's alias, and certainly the Nightwalker part makes a ton of sense for Euron, then that means Euron has been playing with glass candles in Karth. He's been to Ashai and maybe Valeria collecting magical artifacts and magical knowledge, so again, this doesn't seem far-fetched in the slightest. Special extra bonus Euron Dragonlord clue. There's a possible parallel between him and the first and last Emperor of Valeria. The histories of Kohor likewise claim that a visiting dragonlord, Orion, raised forces from the Kohor colonists and proclaimed himself the first emperor of Valyria. He flew away on the back of his great dragon, with 30,000 men following behind afoot, to lay claim to what remained of Valyria and to re-establish the freehold, but neither Emperor Orion nor his host were ever seen again. The name Orion looks and sounds kind of like Euron, and like Orion, Euron is attempting to lay claim to the mantle of the doomed Valyrians. Orion did this in the immediate aftermath of the Doom, and Euron will be doing so during a new long night, so they're both attempting to level up in the wake of a great magical destruction. Finally, I think Euron's end could parallel Orion's, at least to the common memory of Westeros, only Euron will be flying north to the Heart of Winter instead of to doomed Valyria on his great dragon, only to never be seen again. We the reader will of course get to see his epic dragon fight with Jon and Danny in the Heart of Winter, but to the known histories. Euron may end up being known as the first and last god emperor of Westeros, who flew north on the back of his great dragon and was never seen again. Now, I don't want to make too much out of this potential Orion Euron connection. It could be coincidence, but there's enough there to make it worth mentioning. All right, so that covers Euron, the pseudo Valerian. But like I said, he's also been to a shy by the shadow, home of Azor Ahai. He introduces himself at the King's Moot by saying that only one has sailed to a shy by the shadow and seen wonders and terrors beyond imagining. And word about this has spread rapidly, with Rob Stark receiving this report from a fisherman who fled the Iron Isles right after Euron arrived. Euron, Crow's Eye they call him, as black a pirate as ever raised a sail. He's been gone for years, but Lord Balin was no sooner cold than there he was, sailing into Lord's Port in his silence. Black sails in a red hull, and crewed by mutes. He's been to a shine back, I heard. You'll have to excuse my bad pirate voice, but in any case, if Euron has been to Ashai, and I don't see any reason to doubt him as people do sail there with regularity, then he certainly will have seen wonders and terrors beyond imagining. 
Actually, they're not quite beyond our imagining, as we do have an inkling of what kind of knowledge Euron might have acquired there. He probably learned about Azor High and the Dragonlord civilization from whence he came, which I believe is the Great Empire of the Dawn. I used the phrase God on Earth a minute ago to describe Euron's ambitions, and that's no accident. The God on Earth is the title of the mythical first ruler of the Great Empire of the Dawn, and it is in this most ancient sense that Euron sees himself as a god-king. There are several clues about this. First of all, recall that the rulers who came after the God on Earth had titles based on gemstones. Opal Emperor, Tourmaline Emperor, Amethyst Empress, etc. And when Daenerys sees a vision of them as ghosts in her Wake the Dragon dream, they appear with gemstones in their eyes. The lines there were, Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. All right, so with all that gemstone eye stuff in mind, now listen to Euron brag about his exploits around the world. As it happens, I have oft sat upon the sea stone chair of late. It raises no objections. Who knows more of gods than I? Horse gods and fire gods. Gods made of gold with gemstone eyes. Gods carved of cedar wood. Gods chiseled into mountains. Gods of empty air. I know them all. Golden statues with gemstone eyes. Well, that sounds like he's seen some of the leftover idols of the god emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn, either in a shy or perhaps Yi Ti. Euron's blue smiling eye is described as glittering in this passage, which suggests Euron's eye as a blue gem or blue star, thereby drawing a similarity between Euron and those gemstone eyed god emperors. A bit later in this speech, Euron goes on to call himself the godliest man ever to raise sail because he makes everyone pray in fear of him. Euron is the god who inspires fear, in other words. He's the godliest man in that he seeks to become a god-man, a god on earth. Similarly, Euron seems to be the only one besides me and my friend Durin Durandin who sees Daenerys as the Amethyst Empress reborn. The last of her line. They say she is the fairest woman in the world. Her hair is silver gold and her eyes are amethysts. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a green seer wizard to predict that Euron doesn't just want to marry Danny and then feed her figs and wine. Well, he, he might give her some wine, but the point is that his intentions are likely to steer closer to blood magic sacrifice than wedded bliss. Daenerys is a strong parallel to both the Amethyst Empress and Nissa, Nissa who both met a similar end. Nissa, Nissa was murdered by Azor Ahai to work the magic needed to forge Lightbringer, and the original Amethyst Empress was murdered by her brother, the usurping Bloodstone Emperor. According to legend, this Bloodstone Emperor fellow murdering the Amethyst Empress was an act so heinous that it actually caused the Long Night, and wait, 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 a blood magic murder that caused the Long Night? Well, that sounds a lot like Azor Ahai causing the Long Night by cracking open the moon with Nissa, Nissa's murder. And indeed, that's exactly what I've proposed many times, of course, going all the way back to 2015, that the Bloodstone Emperor was Azor Ahai, and that Nissa Nissa was the Amethyst Empress. That's one reason why Daenerys echoes both Nissa Nissa and the Amethyst Empress, for example, and it seems clear that Euron is very much a Bloodstone Emperor type of Azor Ahai reborn figure, someone who practices dark magic and causes the Long Night, and then takes power. Indeed, I would expect that Euron's plan for Daenerys involves using her to work dark magic, just as the Bloodstone Emperor and Azor Ahai both did with their female counterparts. There is some more hopeful foreshadowing for Daenerys, though, and we'll get into that in Euron Part 2. A couple of other Euron Bloodstone Emperor parallels. Euron murdered his sibling, who was the rightful monarch, and then usurped their throne, just like the Bloodstone Emperor did to his sibling. The Bloodstone Emperor worshipped a black stone that fell from the sky, and probably reigned from Ashai, a city built of oily black stone. And then we have Euron sitting on the oily black stone sea stone chair, which actually reads very like a Lovecraftian black meteorite anyway. The Bloodstone Emperor is also potentially tied to the few stone fortress on Battle Isle at Old Town, and there are clues that he actually launched an invasion of Westeros from there. Check out Great Empire of the Dawn Westeros for more on that. Euron is of course about to attack Old Town, and from there the rest of Westeros, so this could be another Bloodstone Emperor parallel. I even think that the ancient legend of a pirate lord setting up shop on the Isle of Ravens at Old Town could be a foggy memory of the Bloodstone Emperor, who would have sailed to Westeros as a pirate from a shy, so to speak. Don't laugh though, a lot of Azor Ahai people are actually pirates or sea captains. Stannis, whom we've talked about already, 
Damon Targaryen, who ruled from Bloodstone Island in the Stepstones, Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, and, of course, Euron. Getting back to the idea of Euron wanting to murder Daenerys as his version of the Amethyst Empress and Nissa Nissa, we see that he's already planning to do this with his salt wife, poor Philea Flowers, a bastard daughter of Lord Hewitt, whose castle Euron has taken. Euron whined and dined her for a hot second, but then at the end of the Forsaken chapter, we see that Philea's been tied to the prow of the ship alongside the damp hair, with both of them seemingly intended as a blood sacrifice to power Euron's dark magic in the coming battle with Old Town. In that sense, both Aaron Dampere and Philia Flowers are actually playing the Nissa Nissa role here, being sacrificed to work blood magic. Here's the first part of that quote. This time, the mutes did not drag him below. Instead, they lashed him to the prow of silence, beside her figurehead, a naked maiden, slim and strong, with outstretched arms and wind-blown hair, but no mouth below her nose. The damp hair's blood is desired by Euron for whatever abomination he's going to work, because Aaron is a priest, and therefore is thought to have holy blood. In the same chapter, Euron says to Aaron, No, I'll not kill you tonight. A holy man with holy blood. I may have need of that blood. Later. Euron has also been imprisoning priests of other religions to use in this same ritual, so it's clearly a big part of his plan. As for Philea Flowers, she's placed in the Nissa Nissa role by virtue of being Euron's wife as she's about to be sacrificed, and it turns out, and this gets pretty dark, let me just warn you, that Philea is pregnant with Euron's child. He beckoned, and two of his bastard sons dragged the woman forward and bound her to the prow on the other side of the figurehead, naked as the mouthless maiden, her smooth belly just beginning to swell with the child she was carrying, her cheeks red with tears. She did not struggle as the boys tightened her bonds. Her hair hung down in front of her face, but Aaron knew her all the same. Aaron compares Philea to the mouthless maiden, and indeed, Philea's tongue has actually been torn out, making her a grisly symbolic match to the mouthless maiden on Euron's ship, for whom the Silence is named. That's important because the Iron Maiden of the Silence is actually Euron's primary Nissa Nissa symbol, in that she essentially represents all of the sacrificed people tied to the prow of Euron's ships. Together with the blood ship's silence that follows behind her, the Iron Maiden is telling Nissa Nissa's story, which means we're about to dissect the lyrics to Iron Maiden's The Numb! Number of the beast! No, no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Although the Forsaken chapter does open with a line, It was always midnight in the belly of the beast, referring to the hold of silence, where Aaron is captive. No, uh, when I compare the silence and its Iron Maiden to Nissa Nissa, what I mean is that we're about to go full mythical astronomy symbolic analysis. I've sort of been trying to keep the mythical astronomy symbolism limited in these recent videos about the others, just to sort of ease some of you new myth heads into things. But that's all getting tossed out the window now, because Euron's symbolism is pure long night moon meteor apocalypse all the way. So buckle up, and if you can stand it, drink some more shade of the evening, and we'll swim in the oceans of blood and darkness inside Euron's twisted mind. So, like I said, the women and the holy men that Euron murders, and the Iron Maiden on the prow of the silence, are symbols of murdered Nissa Nissa and her celestial analog, the Cracked Moon. And, indeed, Nissa Nissa's tragic story, and the moon's tragic story, is told through the waves of blood and night symbolism of the silence. The idea here is the one I mentioned a minute ago with red rain and nightfall. The long night was a darkness caused by a shower of moon meteors, a rainfall of bleeding stars. It's very much an as-above, so-below type of symbolism. So on the ground, Nissa Nissa's blood and soul goes into Lightbringer and sets it on fire. And then up in the sky, the moon's moon blood of bleeding stars become the flaming sword meteors, which bring the fall of the Long Night. Now let's have a look at Euron's ship. On the front is the sacrificed maiden, who's made of black iron and whose eyes are mother of pearl, with pearls being universally regarded as lunar symbols throughout world mythology. She's a symbol of both dead Nissa Nissa and the pieces of dead moon, which became bleeding stars, in other words. And trailing behind her is a ship stained red as blood, like the fiery blood-red tail of a bleeding star. Euron is perceived in multiple visions as sailing on a sea of blood, or even sailing on a burning and boiling sea of blood. So you can pretty much picture Euron standing on the deck of silence as surfing the sky on the back of the Red Comet if you want. Or, speaking in thematic terms, you could say that evil Azor High rides to power on the back of Nissa Nissa's blood sacrifice when the stars bleed. That covers the bloody side of the red rain and nightfall symbolism, and the darkness is found in the sail, which is as black as a starless sky. That's pretty unmistakable blotting out the stars language, and thus the long night sequence is complete. 
Euron's ship shows us a celestial moon maiden turning into waves of bleeding stars which brought the darkness. This is Euron's chariot because he's evil Azor Ahai reborn. This waves of bleeding stars and darkness symbolism is by no means confined to the silence. It's actually Euron's defining symbolism. We see it all over his physical appearance. For example, we see the darkness of the Black Iron Maiden and the Black as a Starless Sky sails, also depicted by Euron's Black Iron Crown, symbol of the darkened sun, as well as his Black Sable Cloak. You'll remember from the last video that Waymar Royce's identical Black Sable Cloak did the blotting out the stars routine in the scene where he was about to become a symbolic Night's King. So Euron's cloak should be seen as one that can cover the sky and blot out the stars, just like his sail. Euron stole that Black Sable Cloak from Baylor Blacktide, whom he killed, and the phrase Black Tide suggests an ocean of darkness. Think of the cosmic ocean of the sky, but robbed of its stars, again like his black sail. Euron's black hair is an ocean of darkness too. It's called Black as a Midnight Sea in a Victarion chapter. The theme is even carried over to his Valyrian steel suit of armor that he wears, which is called As Dark as Smoke. It's dragon metal that looks like smoke, and that evokes the smoke from the impacts of the meteor dragons, which created the starless sky of the Long Night. That's an awful lot of darkness, but we should be sure that it is symbolically implied as flowing from the moon, because Euron's face, which is what's surrounded by all this black accoutrement, is compared to the moon by Aaron Dampere in The Forsaken. He recalls that in one scene that he had seen the moon floating on a black wine sea with a leering face that reminded him of Euron, which is both kind of terrible and kind of fantastic. Aaron is either describing the moon's reflection seeming to float on a black ocean, or he's simply referring to the black sky around the moon as a sea, but either way, it's the same sea of darkness surrounding the Euron-like moon face that we see in Euron's black tide cloak, his starless sky black sails, his black crown, and his black as a midnight sea hair. So think about the mythical astronomy picture of Euron's face here. It's a moon face surrounded by hair, crown, armor, and cloak made of smoke and darkness, which perfectly matches Aaron's vision of a moon face floating on a black wine sea. A black wine sea, in turn, alludes to the shade of the evening, of course, which Euron pours into his moon face. And indeed, all of this symbolism basically portrays the moon as drowning in a sea of darkness. The shade of the long night came from the moon, my friends. I don't know how many more ways you want the author to show us that. Actually, George Martin did in fact come up with an even cooler way of showing us that in the Forsaken chapter. And that would be to have Euron's face explode in tentacles of inky darkness. He saw the longships of the Ironborn adrift and burning on a boiling blood-red sea. He saw his brother on the Iron Throne again, but Euron was no longer human. He seemed more squid than man, a monster fathered by a kraken of the deep, his face a mass of writhing tentacles. As you can see, Euron's moon face has become a mass of writhing tentacles, and of course squids shoot out jets of black ink as a defense mechanism. So it seems like these tentacles are yet another depiction of the clouds of darkness emanating from the moon explosion. Alongside Euron's squid face, we see the Sea of Blood symbol, and this time it's actually burning, which does a terrific job of suggesting waves of bleeding stars, which are really burning meteors. And so once again, we have the entire red rain and nightfall moon disaster symbolism present. All right, look, now I know that standing close to creepy Euron is kind of uncomfortable, especially when he's wearing the sable cloak and the eye patch and nothing else, like in that one Victarian scene where Vic tells him to jump out a window. But unfortunately, we do have to look a little closer at Euron's moon face to find the ultimate blood and night symbolism. I'm talking about Euron's blood eye, both his actual eye and the blood eye sigil that he carries around, as they're both spewing forth waves of blood and darkness too, just like his face. For starters, the name Blood Eye does kind of suggest the eye as being blood red. And then in Aaron's Shade of the Evening Nightmare Vision of Euron talking about the bleeding star signaling the end times, it says, He showed the world his blood eye now, dark and terrible, which associates the blood eye with the apocalypse and the bleeding star. The blood eye is also implied as black, though. Theon thinks of it as black and full of malice, and calling it a crow's eye suggests it as black as well. Euron wears two kinds of patches over his eye, and you'll never guess what colors he picked. Uh, yes, blood red leather and black leather, of course. The blood eye on Euron's sigil is blood red with a black pupil, and above it is the black crown darkened sun symbol. So again, the blood eye is suggested as a symbol of the apocalypse. Indeed, the blood eye sigil is actually a pretty detailed visual depiction of the long night disaster, and it's one of my very favorite symbols, so check this out. 
The Carthene myth seems to describe a solar eclipse alignment at the moment of the moon cracking. It says that the second moon wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat. When a moon appears to wander too close to the sun, well, that's, that's an eclipse. And of course, the only moment when you can actually see the moon close to the sun is during the exact moment of the solar eclipse, when the moon is superimposed over the sun. So now look at that blood eye sigil again. Picture the black pupil of the blood eye as the moon and the surrounding red eye as the ring of the eclipsed sun. Seeing the sun and moon as the eyes of God is of course a classic mythical notion. And in the sky above Planetos, this sun-moon eclipse alignment might well have been perceived as a great eye of doom or one-eyed God whose eye explodes. To help us put all this symbolism together, Martin has given us the lake called the God's Eye, which has a pupil-like island in the middle of it. He then goes on to describe the lake as appearing to be on fire and shining like the sun a few times so that we know to associate it with the sun. And an island full of weirwood trees naturally correlates to the moon because weirwood faces are associated with the moon in several key places. There's the weirwood face black gate, which glows with milk and moonlight, the weirwood moon door in the Erie, and the half weirwood doors of the House of Black and White, which have a giant moon face carved in them. Additionally, the moon has always been seen as having a face inside of it, and many people in A Song of Ice and Fire, including Euron, have moon faces. Ergo, when we look at the god's eye in the Isle of Faces, we can actually see it as a reflection of the sky on the ground. It's a moon pupil island on a lake of fire. The fire of the old gods, of course, since the magic trees on the Isle of Faces literally have the eyes of the old gods on them. So, uh, so sorry to blast you with symbolism like that, but I did warn you. I do hope you're having a good time. Here's the point. The sun-moon eclipse alignment in the sky is like the celestial eye of God, and the thing that kicks off the long night is a giant comet sword, if you will, poking out and blinding that god's eye by crashing into the moon while it stands in front of the sun. Think of Waymar's eye being stabbed by the rain of needle-like sword shards. That depicts this celestial god's eye poking, and then right after, his other eye lights up blue to symbolize the rise of the others and Night's King during the long night. Euron's face tells a similar story. One eye is full of blood and darkness and is implied as blind and covered, and the other one is blue and shining. He shows the world his blood eye when the red comet comes and the apocalypse is at hand, because the blood eye actually represents the original moon destruction apocalypse. Then we have a fellow called Aemond One-Eye Targaryen, who, like Euron, is a one-eyed, dragon-riding, Night's King figure. One of his eyes was blinded with a knife when he claimed his dragon, but he replaced it with a blue star sapphire. So once again we have an eye blinding, the acquiring of magic power, and a blue star eye opening. Then one day, Aemond One-Eye climbed on the back of his dragon, battled with Daemon Targaryen, and had a Valyrian steel sword shoved through his blue star eye, only to have both dragons and riders plunge down into the God's Eye Lake for yet another Dragon comets pierce the god's eye symbol. So many dragon swords, so many eye stabbings. And we will return to this epic aerial dragon fight soon to break down the symbolism in full, so don't you worry. Now that you've got all that, we can see the awesome symbolic synergy that Martin has created with the combined one eye symbolism. When the god's eye is blinded in the sky, the wizard known as Azor High Night's King does an Odin-like transformation, transcending death and gaining powerful magic. That's pretty great stuff, and if you like it, you can find further exploration of all that in my older podcasts. But what it boils down to is that Euron is a walking symbol of the long night moon disaster and the waves of bleeding stars and oceans of darkness which filled the sky thereafter. His ship, his face, his eyes, his hair, his crown, his cape, his armor, and his dragon horn, they all tell the story of fire, blood, and darkness emanating from this great celestial eye. Here's a super gnarly Euron quote that shows his blood eye in action, and it's actually similar to the one where his moon face turned into squid tentacles. This one is from A Dance with Dragons, where Tyrion is asking Makoro about what he sees in his fires. Have you seen these others in your fires? He asked warily. Only their shadows, Makoro said. One most of all, a tall and twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms sailing on a sea of blood. Euron's black blood eye represents the blinding of the celestial god's eye sun-moon alignment, and those black arms are reaching out from it, just as they reached out from Euron's moon face in Euron's vision. Once again, we see the sea of blood to complete the picture, and once again we see Euron sailing to power on that sea of blood, like he was surfing the sky on the red comet. Feel free to draw that, anybody. So as you can see, the red rain and nightfall symbolism is more than consistent with Euron, and the picture it paints is a dark one. It's the long night moon disaster, spelled out step by step. 
The blood magic humans sacrifice, the symbols of Lightbringer's forging, the bleeding stars and waves of darkness, and a magical wizard king of the apocalypse who seems like the darkest, most twisted form of Azor Ahai Reborn imaginable. Euron isn't just an aspiring king of the Long Night, though. He's specifically a Night's King figure, too. Originally, I had planned to cover his Night's King symbolism in the same episode as all this evil Azor High stuff that we just went over. But I think all that symbolism may well have splatted a few brains out there, and so we'll go ahead and call this part one and wrap it up here. We'll pick up right where we left off next time, though, and the evidence for Euron as a leader of the others is going to come hot and he er, cold and heavy, like a big blanket of icy fog that dragons can't fly into and stuff. So, like this video and give it a Share, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel here. A lot of you watching aren't subscribed yet, but I have seen it in the flames that you will be very soon. So give in to fate and go with it. Thanks so much for watching everyone. And thanks most of all to our Patreon sponsors who fuel the fires around here.